Hello friends and welcome back to another episode of Bought the T-Shirt podcast. I'm your host, former Royal Marines Commando turned adventurer Chris Thrall and today I have an absolute pleasure. Anton Shelopanov is a very good friend, brother of mine and we're going to have a chat mate aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes. Looking forward to it. Glad to be here. Yes. There's so much to say about Anton. So in a, in a short soundbite, Anton is Siberian. He's probably the only Siberian I know. There are not that many of us. No. There are only 30 million of us. Is that all? Out of, uh, well, the Russian Federation is something like 150 million people. And Siberia, which is, uh, if you look at the map, it's one sixth of all dry land in the world. Uh, it's only 30 million people. Wow. It's more than I thought. Uh, well, very low population density. And you've got, is it the tigers there? Saber toothed tigers, or is that a thing of the past? I think that's a thing that saber toothed tigers are, have, have left us have during they? the last ice age, about 8,000 years ago. Uh, you still have some Siberian tigers in the far east, uh, near the Chinese border, the area that's, uh, it's called Manchuria. And, uh, yeah, but they're, they're endangered. Mm. They're, they're, there are not very many of them, unfortunately. Could you put some, like, cat food out and maybe they'll? Maybe, maybe. maybe. Mm. I'll, I think because, being serious for a moment, uh, because their habitat is being destroyed, they're, you know, you're not far off that they, they might actually be wandering into towns and eating trash out of, out of, mm. you know, out of dump, dump, dumpsters, as Americans call them. Uh, so yeah, you're not, possibly not far off with cat food. Yeah. Bit like the, um, polar bears then, really. Well, yes, very much. And, and actual bears. Uh, so in Siberia, you still have some bears, wild bears, and some wolves, uh, as well. Uh, and yeah, bears, brown bears do now again due to the destruction of habitat and, uh, climate change. Uh, they are wand- right. wandering into towns and, and again eating, eating out of bins. And yeah, they're, they're starving. They're losing their habitat. Have you losing- seen that video? There's some YouTube clip of a guy in the wilderness. For some reason, something's telling me he's Central European. I'm what we, we used to call Eastern European. But he actually goes up and kicks a brown bear. And then it, it promptly runs away a few yards. And then it turns around and savagely attacks him. Well, why, why would he do that? Why would he do that? Well, something? I don't know. The word, sounds... the word idiot comes to, it comes that's to that's mind. A, that's a, that's a, that's a strong word. Yes. So, uh, as I say, a little brief bit of background on Anton. Fascinating man, probably one of the most fascinating and knowledgeable individuals I've ever met. Uh, Oxford University graduate, and I think it's fair to say, although he'll always be humble on this, one of the country's or the world's leading authorities on prison reform. So this is um, you know, it's kind of, kind of you to say. Yeah. I think there are, well, prison, there are, there are people who know a lot more than me, but uh, I have had a, a career in this field, so I know a little bit. Yeah. And what would you say? What's the kind of, how is that in a nutshell? Why, why do prisons re- need reforming? Well, because, uh, prisons have, uh, four stated goals. Um, so first, first of all, now let's jump back a little bit. There, there are several uh, types of prison systems in the world, and they're, they're partially characterized by the cultural setting, and they're partially characterized by by their history. So you've got uh, some systems in countries which used to be colonized by European countries in the global south, which have inherited a lot of the old uh, colonial style legislation. You've got uh, very violent prisons in places like Latin America. You've got uh, post the post communist space where the system was set up to extract as much economic uh, function out of individuals, essentially slave labor. And then after communism collapsed, uh, there wasn't really very much to replace it. So these are transitioning systems. They're trying to find 
their direction now, what, what are they for, how do they work with people. Then there are still communist countries like Ch- like China, where, again, the system, the system is different. What we have in, let's say, Northern Europe, and Northern Western Europe and the US and some some some, some other similar similar countries maybe OECD countries I think that's that's a it's a reasonable uh, grouping is a is a fairly it's a fairly recent phenomenon it's only about two hundred years old uh, before that imprisonment was very different but this notion of uh, contemplation and reform uh, is is and 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 isolation is something that's just fairly recent and obviously it's now endemic to the biggest prison system in the world which is the United States it's got over two million prisoners although it has been going down a little bit over the last last few years uh, it's uh, very similar in the UK and other northern European countries uh, and whilst they take a slightly you know you hear about Scandinavian countries being very liberal, that's true up to a point, but I think I think in my experience it, the differences between prisons are marginal. So that's a little bit of, of context of, of what we're talking about. We're talking about these Northern Hemisphere, let's say, OECD country prisons like the US and the UK and other parts of Western and Northern Europe and maybe some other countries like Australia. Um, so in these places, let's see if I can get this right, prisons have uh, four stated goals. Right. The first is vengeance. Right. Somebody did something bad and society or individuals want to extract revenge. Uh, the second is deterrence. So if you do something, you will go to prison. Prison is not a nice place. So don't do this thing that will land you in prison. Uh, the third notion is what we just touched on rehabilitation that uh, you know the, the, the idea that if you take somebody uh, somebody somebody to 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 prison to to a prison uh, you have the chance to offer people education and employment training and maybe treatment for addiction whatever so that, that kind of rehabilitative notion that uh, Victor, victorian very strong strong and sort of in the victorian victorian consciousness uh, kind of the whole Quaker sort of Protestant thing, um, and then finally uh, isolation. So, what if you take a person who is uh, deemed dangerous out of society and you isolate them in a secure setting, then they are unlikely to cause harm to the outside world, right? So, these are the four stated goals. This is this is what. Uh, pretty much all Western, Northern European systems, you will find this in the political rhetoric, you will find this in the mission statement, and so ref- very various reflections of those four goals in different combinations. Some countries might, might uh, or some re- jurisdictions might press more on the deterrence side, some might focus more on the rehabilitative side, but you will find some elements of those four in, in all in, in, in all prison system uh, sort of missions. Um, now, the truth is that, you know, I can say, hand on heart, universally, all prison systems fail in the first three of those completely, and in the fourth one, almost completely, or partially. So... Let's take them one by one. Yeah, please do. Uh, let's look at punishment. If something bad happens to you or your family, and then something, you know, some kind of sanctions is, a, is imposed on the person who did this, does it, you know, does it, does it make people feel better? Probably not. Like it's 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 un, it, it's unlikely. You know, you always hear, you know, this person didn't get a lot enough sentence. Or this person didn't go to the right kinds of conditions. The conditions are too lenient, or it's the wrong kind of regime. Um, partly, it has to do with the way it's communicated, communicated in the press. Uh, one of the one of the trade-offs for having a free press in a democratic society is that uh, that press is going to say what it likes in order to make itself popular in order to 
engage the audience and so on. So there will be sometimes exaggeration, uh, sometimes playing on a, maybe not exaggeration, but, but highlighting a certain thing or playing on certain emotions. You know, a lot of it is, is, is very emotional. So does it achieve the desire for vengeance? I would argue not, and perhaps your audience might might comment on this on on this mm. clip and, and and disagree with me, and I think I would welcome that debate. <laughs> so, secondly, what was the second thing that I, that I said? Is it uh, deterrence? With, with the second thing, deterrence. Does the idea of criminal sanction deter crime? Well, I mean, there is actually there is a book here on my my shelf by Tom Tyler, which I would recommend. It's called uh, "Why People Obey the Law." Look it up. Uh, it's 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 it discusses this at great length, and I think the answer is no. I think you know if we talk about, for example, uh, and I hope we'll come to this uh, a bit later in the conversation, um, somebody who is suffering from addiction and they need to find financial means to be able to pay for some substance. Uh, or indeed, if they are intoxicated, is the notion of going to prison likely to prevent that person from committing some kind of offense to either acquire something or to act out? It's not, is it? No. And the fact that we have crime and the fact that we have high rates of reoffending, you know, up to two thirds in most OECD countries, northern European countries, uh, I think shows that the deterrence aspect of criminal sanction, criminal justice sanction, doesn't work. Uh, let's look at rehabilitation. Uh, Can we just say that that there's there's so many people. I don't know if you can say it's a ma- ma- majority, but there's so many young people. I, for me, it's young men who I've worked with in the past that are filling up the prison system for drug offences. Related to addiction, mm-hmm. we need to remember addiction is a mental health condition, so it's an, it's technically an, an but, illness, right? Well, let, let's also not forget that up to a quarter of new opiate addictions, for example, are acquired are acquired in prison, for example. So it's not just that people are going to prison for drug offenses. Actually, a, quite a large proportion of people who go to prison also acquire new addictions when yeah. they come there. So we're criminalizing people for being unwell, which is pretty crazy. It's quite draconian when you when you look at it, right? Well, we can talk. We can talk about mental health and uh, and uh, how so there are. I I I have worked uh, in some countries and with, in some settings where I think I think there are some not good but helpful solutions. To, to some of those issues, so we can we can touch on that a little bit later. So going back to your so rehabilitation, well, that's exa- it's, it's it's exactly your point, uh, and we already started talking about this. Does prison rehabilitate? Well, there might be there might be some single figure individual cases, and these do tend to be quite high profile cases, uh, where people say yes, I've you know gone straight. Or whatever the phrase is, I've achieved this. And is that down to the prison system necessarily? Is that down to people's experience of the prison system? Maybe down to negative experiences. But does prison rehabilitate? Well, look at the reoffending rates. The reoffending rates are up to two thirds. And that's, that's the detected ones. Uh, look at the new addictions which are acquired in prisons. Uh, look at the violence which occurs in prisons. Is it, a re- rehabilitative environment as uh, somebody who has been to prisons in over 20 countries and they work with justice systems you know all, all over the world and different continents i again would argue it's certainly not i'm sure your some members of your audience might disagree and again i would i would welcome mm-hmm. that that debate and people may have different experiences and finally the the isolation aspect, the sort of the, you know, if, if you if you get somebody who is dangerous and you put them in and, you know, isolate them, they can't commit further crimes. Well, maybe, up to a point, maybe some prisons succeed in this, uh, or in some cases it's successful, but, you know, you look at some of the highest profile crimes, 
even over the last 10 years, like the terrorist atrocity, the Madrid bombings, the train bombings in Madrid, the terrorist atrocity, that was all planned from inside prisons. Mm. Um, if you look at the fact that mobile phones uh, and other communication technology is endemic, it's very easy to bring them. People do acquire mobile phones in prisons. Uh, this I, this, isola- this concept of isolation is becoming less and less... Can I just uh, chip relevant. in there, and I just want to talk from my own experience. Because back along, um, I kind of have my brushes with the law. Um, and without going into too much detail, it's, it's a subject for an- another another day. But I was very lucky I didn't get sent to prison. Mm-hmm. But just by appearing in court was such a, a, a wake-up call, such a shock, such a... Uh, almost like it brought to light for me what I was doing, which was wrong, inherently hurting other individuals that had not done anything to me. And that whole experience was enough to make me completely reassess my values and my actions. And, so and so you feel the court appearances or appearance did have a rehabilitative effect? Well, when you're faced, and I'd already spent, I think, two nights in the police cells, mm-hmm. when you're faced with maybe losing a few years of your life or at least spending it in a, in a penitentiary um, prison, oh my God, you suddenly have a wake-up call and you think, my God, what have I been doing? And and that was enough for me to, right. to realign my values and make me go on and, and, and you know, I'm not saying I've not done stupid things since, but I, I haven't gone down mm-hmm. that criminal route. Okay. Whereas for our young people now, it seems to be sending people to prison, say, because they were dealing weed, you're putting them in... Well, a lot and yeah, non-violent offences. You know, yeah. non-violent offences. You're putting them... And we've got to remember, without trying to upset people here, but, but prisoners very often are the victims too, victims of child oh, yeah, abuse, yes, yes. Uh, mental health. Uh, there is a... There is... Nobody is just a victim or just an offender or just a hero uh, or whatever. There is a huge overlap and... Uh, I would say the majority, probably more than 50% of people in prison, have been victims of crime and quite serious crime uh, themselves. It goes much hu- it goes much higher for women who are in prison. More than two-thirds of women have been victims of all sorts of violence, uh, sexual violence, uh, physical violence, uh, and so on. And also, we have to remember that quite a large... Uh, proportion of young men, men in prison, also have traumatic brain injury as well, which is a, uh, a major factor in all of this. I think my point was chucking all these young people who are in themselves victims in a cage with, uh, say, for example, lifetime offenders who don't see any way out of crime is in, indoctrinating right. them into this lifestyle that maybe, had they had the shock that I had, they would have well. Th- so there is a lot there. So let's 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 un- unpack all of that. Let's 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 touch on your last point first. Uh, the this idea of lifetime offenders. I think we need to separate out a person who is who 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 has a who has a lifetime of offenses and the person who has a life sentence. Now, people who have life sentences, which is usually for very serious crimes like murder. Um, Actually, from experience, and a lot of prison staff will tell you this, they actually have quite a lot to lose because they hope to be out on license at some point in 20 years' time. So they have a lot to lose. So generally, they are seen as a more stable group Mm. of prisoners. They're seen as a more stable uh, population, whereupon maybe some younger men uh, who are in for a short time uh, may be less stable, may be less stable, but you know I have heard it said by some prison officers that actually so-called lifers, in uh, le- later in their sentence, if they're mixed with a more short-term, short-term younger prisoners, they actually have a stabilizing influence yeah. because they have more to lose, and if something kicks off, if there's trouble, if there are problems, it's bad for everyone, 
uh, it, it has a negative impact for everyone. So, so these uh, these prisoners might exercise a kind of uh, a bit of restraint. Mm. Uh, so, so, so that 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 that's so that that's, that's that's one difference. Where, whereupon, as you say, a lifetime of crime, a lifetime of offenses. I think that's something different. That's uh, somebody who I think the point the point I was making is more. You know, you're putting these guys that were that have made one crime. It's a one-off. If it was dealt in the right way, they'd probably be put off crime for life, and 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 if they were supported to yes. live, and 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 possibly either. Uh, so 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 let's let let let's let's go back to to what you said about the court appearance. So, uh, the way people go through life and the way people interact with the state, including at the extreme end, which is the justice system, is usually via a series of uh, crisis points, and the crisis points in terms of criminal justice are possibly the point of committing the offence, the point of being arrested, the point of appearing in court, the point of being sentenced, the point of going to prison, mm. the point of being released from prison. These are all transition points. These are all crime. They're crime, all crime, like crime. little wake-up calls, aren't they? They, they, they can be little wake-up calls, but also at those points, unfortunately, it's where people pass between different agencies and different systems, and a lot of the time they don't. They don't meet up. A lot of the time, there is no continuity, and there have been various attempts in England over the last England Wales uh, over the last twenty years. The idea of the National Offender Management Service originally in the early two thousands, it was actually uh, to have end to end sort of case workers from the very early stage of somebody's uh, journey through the justice system towards their exit from the system. But that never really happened, and the National Offender Management Service ended up being just another sort of triangular structure, which didn't achieve any of those four stated goals that we discussed at the beginning of this conversation. But yes, so uh, I agree, uh, it's, these crisis points are, can be wake-up calls, but they're also the points where people can fall through the cracks between the different agencies, between the different systems. Very much so, so I think I think I think have we addressed? Yeah, the, no, those, I think, those I think three, we, three different things. We have. I mean, America's system is. Is it fair to say it's one huge failure, or, or, or the U.S. Don't, it, don't it, they imprison more people? I think Sean Atwood would tell us more about this. So the U.S. is the highest imprisoner in the world uh, in terms of absolute numbers. Uh, the U.S. holds something like a fifth or a quarter of all prisoners. It's over two million prisoners. Um, and also in terms of the prison population rate, I, I would need to look this up. There is a very uh, helpful resource online if, if your audience would like, members of your audience would like to look this up. It's called the World Prison Brief Online, and it's uh, a project that I worked on many, many years ago, maybe 15 years or more, 20, nearly 20 years ago, and it continues to be published by a uh, part, part of the University of London, the Institute for Criminal Policy Research, ICPR. And it's it's the data from the last however many twenty or thirty years for every country. It's got the prison population, the prison population rate, uh, the proportion of uh, remand prisoners, women prisoners, children in, in the prison systems there, and it tracks both the rates and the uh, uh, and the absolute numbers as well for for every country in the world, or almost every country in the world. So yes, the U.S. Uh, it reached. A peak about ten years ago of over two million prisoners, and then the absolute number has stayed stable, but the rate has gone down a little bit because it's the population has grown. So the rate has gone down a, a little bit, but it still remains, I think, the number one big well big country, the one number one big con country which imprisons which imprisons people in the world. There might be some small island nations which. Kind kind of because they're such small countries and they have like some big spike at a particular moment that might distort the top ten a little bit. But the U.S. in terms of uh, continuity, it is, it is number one. But the thing with uh, hyper incarceration is uh, it leads to a crisis. It leads to a public health crisis. It leads to a mental health crisis. It leads to a, a public finances crisis because prison is very expensive. And if you look at the U.S., the U.S. spends something like five times more on its prison systems than it does on higher education, right? So uh, 
so these crises result in some very negative outcomes, of course, but they also, in particular in the U.S., actually, I have observed this, and I've, I've worked with a few states in the U.S., they do produce a real can-do attitude in terms of trying to solve these problems. Um, and I believe the, the technical term is burning platform innovation. So when the thing that you're standing on is on fire, you figure you quickly have to figure out a way of getting off the thing or putting out the fire. So whilst uh, I would say a lot of the United or a lot of the states in the U.S. remain in a crisis, we've also seen some very innovative approaches. Uh, I would highlight the experience of New York, both city and state, which has managed to reduce dramatically reduced its prison population and reduce crime at the same at the same time uh i would highlight missouri which actually quite a long time ago uh uh by but more than 20 years ago pioneered a fairly unique approach to youth justice so the missouri model of dealing with with young people who enter the justice system is 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 a, a very interesting one mm. Uh, so yes, the, the, there is a lot of harm being caused by hyper-incarceration, not just in the US, but elsewhere, uh, but also the crisis leads to innovative approaches, because uh, if you think about it, people who go to work in the justice system, a lot of people, well, like yourself, Chris, you have worked uh, as an addiction support worker uh, in the past, uh, it's people who want, and, and obviously a lot of the people you worked with or some of the people were justice involved. In oh, some, in oh some mass- massively. It's uh, was hand in glove in a lot of scenarios. Yeah. And, 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 you know, why, why did you why did you go into that? Because you wanted to help people. Mm. And it's entirely possible that somebody with your experience might have been working in a prison as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a lot of people who, who go into the justice system, some of them go into it possibly for similar reasons that people go into the military and that they want to keep society safe. Either from, you know, people going to the military because they want to keep society safe, their country safe from external threats. Uh, people who go into the justice system to work in the justice system want to keep uh, the country, their, their community safe from crime. So maybe there is that driver. Other people going, people who work in education, people who are drug support workers, uh, and social workers and others, uh, go in because they want to help people. They want to help people get better. They want to help people improve their lives, have better outcomes, and, and, and a mixture, and a mixture of the two as well. You know, it's not just I'm one. I'm just going to, um, I'm conscious of our time here, folks, so I'm just going to move this forward a bit, but I just wanted to, um, my, my experience of working with young offenders, uh, was a fascinating one, but, and it was very rewarding in a way. As part of a university placement, I put in for a, organization run by a fellow former marine who was he, in a nutshell without being too specific he he got a team he he got someone within the prison to pick the young men who he deemed were looking for a way out of their their criminal past mm-hmm. many of whom had uh, uh, were recovering from addiction so i went to work with them at a, a let's say an old manor house that was up on Dartmoor and these 30 lads were there and they were getting shown some sometimes simple things like how to wash, how to cook, um, basic life skills. And I went in as part of my university placement for three months. On the first day, I just explained who I was, a little bit about my own, um, you know, dare I say criminal well, your, your background, your, yeah, your experiences. Yeah, and, 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 and how I, I, I turned it around and I showed some photographs of my travels. And again, cutting a long story short, the response I got was phenomenal. The effect I could have as a, as a positive male role model, and I think there's a clue there in this. Um, there is actually a word for it as well. Pro, the, the technical term, I'm sorry to be technocratic, uh, pro-social modeling. Yeah. It's called, so you've got antisocial behavior and so on, and then you've got pro-social. Yeah. And people don't call it that because it's a bit of a technical term, but that's what you were doing. 
So, I mean, a lot of these guys were obviously lacking a positive uh, role, male role model in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I was able to come along and not just be a positive role model, but I guess use my people skills to, to really push the right buttons and had an amazing result. Mm -hmm. The first day together, or, or the second day, for example, we took some sports, we played football, and we agreed, and this is my Marines background coming out now, the losing team would have to jump in the lake. And this was the middle of winter and there was this boggy, marshy lake. And we played the game. My team, I was captain of one team, we won. The other team all started. That's good luck. Yeah, the other good team luck. all started, oh, we got to jump in the lake. And they're walking down there in trepidation slowly. And then I just winked at my team and said, and we just ran past them and all dived into this lake completely against all health and safety that you, you have these days. And once the lads, the losing team saw us running down, they all ran down and we're all, we're all swimming in this, in this bog, basically. And just a simple act like that gave to these guys their dignity, their respect, their hope for the future, uh, love, um, a, a, a feeling of accomplishment, of, a, of achievement. But I'm going to um, uh, move on now because I'm, I am conscious of the time. I got to get a train back to Plymouth. By the way, folks, we're in Tottenham now. Um, so can you explain your T-shirt? Ah, uh, yes. So I am wearing an old T-shirt. It says uh, "Red Army RC Red Army Riding Club." Uh, uh, my brother Chris here and I are both members of this motorbike riding club. It is a charitable and social uh, club. We we love riding, but uh, and we love partying. But uh, we also uh, try to do our bit to give to give something give something back to society. And we've just had a very successful fundraiser for a small charity here in North London called Out and About. And it works with students from uh, a special school who have severe uh, and complex, multiple complex uh, education and mobility needs. Um, and it takes them, this charity takes them on trips to nature, to the forest, to the seaside, to cultural events. And unfortunately, this year they've lost a couple of uh, major donors mm. and they were worried that they might not be able to uh, take some of these young people to some of the trips that they so cherish. And uh, we stepped in and we've raised uh, over a thousand pounds. Well, not, not, not we, uh, the people, our, our friends, our community has very generously donated over a thousand pounds. I think we're up to something like 1,250 pounds if you include gift aid. So, uh, it's a, it's a really great feeling and hopefully this charity will be able to run the trips that they wanted to this year. Uh, yeah, that's that's one of the one does, of the reasons. Ansel does an amazing job of organising this every year. It means an awful lot to these small charities, and I should just say that I'm the chaplain of the Red Army Riding Club. Yes, and, and Chris, Chris's function uh, in this club is uh, very much. It's a, the word chaplain doesn't mean it's a religious role. It means that uh, Chris. Th thank you, Padre. Uh, Chris, Bless uh, you, Chris, my son. Chris's role is to uh, provide uh, pastoral uh, support to other members yeah. like myself and to, a, to, 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 to talk to us when we think that there is something we need to, to talk through. Our thoughts, our feelings sometimes. No, not, not every, not everything is lovely and positive all the time. And Chris's role, which he does amazingly well, is to to support the other members of this of this motorbike riding club. So briefly, uh, three questions. Most inspirational person? Oh, that's a very very tough one. I I am I am tempted to say you, but uh, I think that's uh, yeah. I think I think that's that's possibly a little bit too sycophantic. He's only human. Um, yeah, I'm I'm, ju I'm just human. Um. It, there are many inspirational people, uh, but I think in terms of what we are talking about today, which is justice reform, I would say uh, it's uh, my first uh, my first boss, 
which is uh, Baroness Vivian Sturen. And she was for uh, over 20 years, she was the director of a charity called the National Association, Association for the Care and Resettlement of Offenders, NACRO. And then in the late That's 90s, right. for her work, was awarded first the CBE and then was elevated to the House of Lords as a crossbench as an independent peer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, she and her husband, Professor Andrew Coyle, uh, well, kind of shaped shaped my early career and and taught me so much. So, uh, in terms of justice reform, what we're talking about, I would say Baroness Vivian Stern and Professor Andrew Coyle, uh, okay. both incredible people, now retired, but but still 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 active, still working. A worthy cause. So, most influential or inspirational book. Other than eating smoke, of other than course. eating smoke or Forty Nights, it's, it's another uh, very powerful book. Um, again, it's it's impossible to it's impossible to 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 say what's the most inspirational book. Uh, can I recommend one book? Yeah, I think it's great. It's, a, it's, a, it's a non-fiction book, uh, and it's by a guy called Matthew Crawford, who is an American motorbike mechanic. Actually, he was he worked for a conservative think tank for he got a PhD from a uh, university in the US, worked for a conservative think tank for about six months and was basically didn't like it because he was he felt he was being made to produce evidence to order kind of thing. Jacked it all in, opened a one man motorbike repair shop, worked on the motorbikes and writes very good philosophy, I think in my opinion. So I would recommend his book The Case for Working with Your Hands. Uh, and the subtitle is Why Office Work is Bad for You and Fixing Things is Good. Uh, and I think this, this might appeal to some, to some, to some of your audience. I think it's, it's a very I good I love book. it already. Matthew Crawford. Final question. Film. That's a big, that's, that's, again, that's another, that's another huge question. Uh, in terms of or one uh, that you've just uh, really enjoyed, in terms of uh, a film which I think is both great art and very entertaining for me, and it's, it's a film that stayed with me, uh, maybe a bit strange. Batman Returns, the second Tim Burton Batman film with Michael Keaton as Batman. Batman Returns, I oh, think okay. it's it's stronger than the first one, in which of course Jack Nicholson famously upstaged Michael Keaton as the Joker. Uh, and yeah, I think I think it's a it's a it's a darker, it's a more artistic film, but it's also very very entertaining. And you know, I I love the Batman comic books, and I think ba- Batman Returns. It's a film which I've I return to. I've seen it more than once. Is Batman Marvel or am I? I think Batman is DC. DC, that's right. And it's it, it, it's yeah. a, it's a Tim Burton film. Brilliant. Okay, dear friends, thank you for watching. Anton, you've been a cracking guest. Thank you. We will uh, pick this up next time. I hope so. We've got lots more to talk. We can talk about our snowboarding adventures. It's been pretty, yeah. pretty amazing. Some interesting injuries. I don't know whether you can see the scar, scar mm-hmm. there. Quite a lot of titanium in the bones as a result. And also, Anton's going to tell us about his uh, three thousand mile road trip on your motorbike around Europe last year. Yes, I could I... solo around Europe, of which there will be a book. Coming out? I hope so. Yeah, brilliant. Anton. Thank, thank you, you very much, brother. Really appreciate it. Friend, thank you for watching my video. I'm the only person I know that has ticked every item off my bucket list, and I did so coming back from chronic addiction with no help from anybody. Now I want to pass those skills on to you, but I can't help you unless you help me and hit the subscribe button. So please do so and let's go and smash this world together.